Well, it's that time of year again. It's the time for me to preach a sermon that some of you don't need to hear and the rest of you don't want to hear. And Reagan's coming over with our prop here. So given that, I'm going to be a really popular guy by the end of this one. But let's just do it. How many of you have watched the, well, let's do this. How many of you received a DVD in the mail from us? How many of you have watched it? Okay, thank you if you did. Uh, if you did not receive a DVD, we can get one for you. And if you watched it, this picture will look kind of familiar to you. We're beginning what we call our stewardship campaign and talking about what it means to give from the bottom up. There are a couple of um, reasons that we tend to cringe and shrink up when pastors and churches start talking about money. One is Western individualism, because in our culture, it's my life, my stuff, my business. I'll get back to that in a minute. The other reason, though, is because it has been abused, hasn't it? Haven't we read the news stories of pastors and churches who have abused uh, their parishioners' money and extorted it and done all these things? I actually have a quick video clip to show you of, uh, of an example of that. Let's see if it will work for us this morning. Three years ago, so there would probably be at least $150 million more added to this. Well, their income last year was over $100 million. So um, there has been over a billion three come into this ministry since it went into operation. So, amen. I'm not a billionaire because there's been over a billion dollars come through this ministry. I am a billionaire because... The assignment that the Lord gave me, he said, I want you to begin to confess the billion flow. Because as long as you were in the million flow, you were winning millions. You go into the billion flow, you win billions. So I said, yes, sir, I believe I receive it. That's been a number of years ago, and I have confessed that I am in the billion flow and that I am a billionaire in the kingdom of God. You like how he added at the end, in the kingdom of God. Right. That's Ken Copeland. I don't know where he is now, but he's one of these ministers that's been found to have taken huge advantage of uh, the things that people have given him. For good measure, by the way, um, there is ver one very good indicator that you can use to find out whether a pastor or church is misusing money. You know what it is? As one person said in the last service, the pastor's car. If the pastors have a standard of living that is significantly higher than the majority of the congregation, there is something amiss. And no pastor should take home a salary that is significantly larger than the average income of the congregation. That's how you know. This church is generous. When I was interviewing with this church, I was quickly amazed by how much this church does. And if you watch the video, there's a, another person, another couple who said the same thing. This church does not have a generosity problem at all. There are so many things that we've been able to attain and use and do thanks to the generosity of our people. So much. We uh, live stream on the internet. This service goes live on the internet every Sunday morning and we do it with a piece of equipment up there that is worth $8,000 and it was donated by someone. We don't have a generosity problem. So why do we still struggle 
to meet basic expenses in our operating budget. I want to list a bunch of things for you that this church has been able to do or has that just came to my mind. And your job, first of all, is to remember as many of these as possible, okay, as I read them. Here we go. Upward, Backpack Bash, Bicycle Safety Day, Wednesday Family Night Meals, Mortgage on the CCLC, One Great Hour of Sharing, America for Christ Offering, World Mission Offering, Retired Ministers and Missionaries Offering, Operation Christmas Child, Materials and Paint for the Original Faith Forest Transformation, the Faith Forest Cove, the new room down there for the children, the startup of the Connection Gathering, our alternative service, many of our musical instruments, puppets, new choir robes, the new prayer chapel, church library, the video equipment upstairs, our new signs outside the building, the new TVs in the welcome areas, our fellowship fund, which helps people with bills and utilities that they can't pay, the weekly sanctuary altar flowers, and even the stickers and mailers and DVDs for this campaign. Do you remember all those? Now, how much of the money given for all those things went towards this church's operating expenses? None. Now, that's great in one way. Look at all the things we've been able to do up here. These colors up here of the arrow represent some of these other special things that we get to do as a church. And if you watch the video, the yellow is represented by mission giving and special offerings. This is represented, or this represents uh, special projects here within the church that has its own separate cash flow, upward basketball, backpack bash, those kinds of things. And here we said this can represent, the, the blue can represent memorials and endowments and other special gifts like that. We've been able to do so many things with the generosity of families after a loved one passes away, people who believed in this church and wanted to improve it. Uh, thanks, for example, to one memorial, we now have, if you come this way or this way down the road, you know what church this is, right? It's the new signs. And some of these outreach projects and some of these focuses on community that we've been able to do, there is no generosity problem at this church. So we wondered if maybe what's going on is we just need to move some things around a little bit. Talking about giving from the bottom up. Because you see, I didn't talk about this green part. This green part represents, you know, that flashy, attractive, motivating part of any church's ministry, the operating budget. Aren't you excited? I mean, the things up here, you know, there are so many people who believe in so many of the things that we do, the special things we've been able to do, that there are people who are here because of those things. People who have come to be involved in this church because they say, a church that gives out 600 backpacks, I want to be a part of that church. A church that gives kids a safe and warm place to play basketball in a positive environment in the winter, I want to be a part of that church. But we have a financial foundation. Without staff or facilities, we don't have what we need to accommodate all of this. And that's why we're talking this year about giving from the bottom up. Because we can't kid ourselves that, you know, that the thing, we, we are able to do things somehow without any resources or, or money. That's what it takes. But the question we started asking ourselves is maybe if we have a problem, maybe it's the fact that we have to put first things first. But this is a very generous congregation. Hypothetical. 
let's pretend that uh, you have pledged to give $300 a month to the church. Uh, we, when we come to Thanksgiving Sunday, that's going to be the Sunday when we ask for you to commit to the amount that you will give to this church's ministry in 2013 because we have no other income besides the members. But let's pretend that you commit to give $300 a month to the church. You've pledged that amount. And it's October, and you, you say to yourself, I really want to give to that world mission offering. Uh, I believe in our missionaries. I want to see God's work done overseas. I'm going to give $100 to the world mission offering. <clears throat> and then you also see uh, a special need uh, over here, uh, maybe something in the building that needs to be fixed or something like that. Uh, and you give another $100 to that particular need. And so then you're counting this up, and you say to yourself, well, I've, I've only committed $300 a month. I've already given $200, so I only have $100 more to go to meet my obligation. Yes or no? Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Uh, that'll put us $200 in the hole. Because what you pledge to give, you pledge to give here with anything else being above and beyond that amount. We had a couple this past year who believed in the Backpack Bash so much they gave $1,000 to the Backpack Bash. Now, I don't know anything else about them and their finances and what they pledge, but let's pretend that they had pledged $300 a month and had said... We gave $1,000 to the Backpack Bash, so we're good for three months. Makes sense, but doesn't work. Giving from the bottom up, making sure that we've got, to use an example from personal finances, to make sure that we've got our mortgage and our bills and utilities paid for before we go to Bermuda. You know, that's how most of us do it. As a church, we also have to do that. Now, the Bible talks a lot about money, despite the fact that it makes us cringe today in 21st century America. In Exodus 23, we read about this command that God gave the ancient Israelites to bring the first fruits of their field, of their crop, into the temple. First fruits, a tithe, which means 10%. They were to bring the first and the best of their crop into the temple. And let's call it the community treasury. Their first and their best of their crop. And the rest were for them to live on. Now that's part of it. We didn't read the other part that actually uh, is mentioned in Deuteronomy 24 where it says this, when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So now we get the full picture of God's vision for the economics of these people. They had, now if you didn't farm, you didn't live. You know, very agricultural society. Uh, wheat, fruit, nuts, those types of things. And so most people who were not somehow independently wealthy had their field, harvest it, which is, of course, very sophisticated. You know, the way they got the olives was to beat the daylights out of the tree. It says, after you harvest all this, and you didn't have modern-day equipment, so they're going to miss some stuff. So the pastor says, don't go back and get what you missed. Leave that for the needy. And then take what you've got and give the first and the best 10% to God and the rest you live off of and there's the picture now modern day 
response to this might be, heck no. You know, it's my, it's my stuff. I worked for it. I watered it. I plowed it. I pruned it. You know, this 10%, this best going to the temple is bad enough, but I'm certainly not going to leave the extras for the lazy poor people. We don't find that attitude in Scripture. You plow it, you leave what you miss, first and the best 10% goes to the temple. And then we read in Acts this picture of the early church in the first century. It tells us that there was no needy person among them. They testified to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them, it says. And then it tells us why. It tells us that they had people in their group who had fields or houses or maybe animals that they didn't need to live. It was beyond what they needed. And so these people would sell those things and bring 100% of the proceeds and put it at the apostles' feet. And they would then keep it and distribute it to people who had need, recognizing that not everyone among them could do this. Not everybody can tithe. We have people in our congregation who are in dire financial straits. They can't do it. But God said because they operated like this, because they didn't have this mentality of I get what I pay in, you know, it's a one-on-one return, they had this community treasury that if anybody had anything they didn't need, they sold it, brought it to the apostles' feet, and they distributed it. Some people today would call that kind of setup the redistribution of wealth. They called it generosity. They called it compassion. We're the ones mis- mixed up. <clears throat> but they had this community treasury and people brought in the proceeds from what they didn't need. Now, I don't know about you, but our deal sounds easier to me. How many times have you been asked to sell everything that you don't need and bring 100% of the proceeds to the church? I don't think this room would be as full. That's never asked of us. To tithe is to give 10%. And that's part of what the picture that God draws for his community of believers. Their first and their best goes to God. Now, some might say or think, now let's get real here. What right does a pastor have to get up and tell me what to do with my money? A pastor gets up in the pulpit with a microphone and says, if you can, give 10% of your income to the church. Tithe. Some are offended by that. More and more today are offended by that kind of thing. Well, a couple of responses. Number one, I'm not asking you to do anything that I don't do. I'm one of your pastors, which means I get a paycheck, and my wife also works, and every month we give 10% to this church because we believe in tithing, because we know it takes everybody. So I'm not, I'm not, blowing hot air as they say I'm not asking you to do something that I don't already do secondly as I kind of pointed out already um, compared to the expectations of those early communities we actually have it somewhat easy one thing we see is they were they were truly living as a community and when you do that that's what happens when you don't have needy persons 
among you. That when you live as a collection of individuals, then you have everyone going their own way and doing their own thing and may not know each other or their needs. We saw them living in community. And the expectations and the demands were high. I'll take the 10%. But finally, one thing that I've come to believe about the concept of tithing is that it's not a situation where God is asking us to give him 10% of what is ours or the church is asking us to give 10% of what is ours. What's going on is God is letting us keep 90% of what is his. Do you believe that everything belongs to God? Do you believe that God is the author and creator of everything? That's what I believe. And it has led me to a point of generosity that God actually requires so little and that he has entrusted me with so much. Think about all the things God has entrusted into our care that we have the potential of messing up. Our family, our church, the gospel message, our communities, our resources. Thank you to all of you of this church. Many of you have been here way longer than I have. You've been faithful. You've been committed. This church does not have a generosity problem. Thank you for what you have done. And as we go forward, I just want you to think with me, dream with me. What is possible? What more is possible up here if we get to a point where we have nothing to worry about down here? Think with me, dream with me, what is possible if all of us do our part, what we can, to give from the bottom up and continue to be amazed at how God can take our loaves of bread and fishes, what little we give, and multiply it and bless it into the many, many ministry opportunities that this church has seen over its 155 years.